Hello, and thanks for joining me. Any list of the top 10 objections to atheism will obviously be subjective. People will wonder why I didn't include this objection or that objection, and I may very well look at their comments, slap my forehead, and go, yeah, Dave, why didn't you include that one? Well, all I can say is, these are the 10 that occurred to me when I sat down to make this video. Real quick before I start, if you want to help this channel grow, please hit the like and subscribe buttons. And if you know someone who might like this video, or who desperately needs to hear it, hit the share button. With that, let's get to the list. By the way, a Christian might ask, why are you doing the 10 worst objections? Why not the 10 best? Well, to be honest, my inspiration comes from William Lane Craig and his lecture on the top 10 worst objections to the Kalam cosmological argument. So, you know, you can take it up with him. Alright, here are the top 10 worst objections to atheism. 1. If atheism is a lack of belief, then that means rocks are atheists. Any Christian who has ever said this, think back to the last time someone asked you a question and you didn't know the answer and you replied, I have no idea. Were you telling that person that you have no ideas in your head at all, that you are in fact brain dead? If not, then don't pretend you're not familiar with the idea of words and ideas having a limited scope. The atheism-theism dichotomy obviously only applies to sentient beings. That's why you don't regard a rock as an atheist, or a very young child as a theist. I'm just going to leave this here for a second. Okay. 2. Atheists are only atheists because they don't want God to exist. This idea gets a lot more attention than it should because of the new atheism movement. Guys like Hitchens and Dawkins, who make really good points about what a terrible guy God would be if he actually existed, and how harmful religion is to the human race, don't have much of anything to say on the question of whether God actually exists. Which, as far as I'm concerned, is the most important question. If he doesn't exist, then all the new atheists are telling us, really, is that we dodged a bullet. If he does exist, then we're all screwed. And by we, I mean Christians and atheists alike, because with the kind of God that most, not all, but most Christians seem to worship, it doesn't seem to me that we can trust him to keep his word to save those who believe. As for the harm being done by religion, this is not a point that needs to be made by atheists. 3. Atheists are only atheists because they want to be free to sin. Except for the whole loving God going to church thing, I believe I live my life in a way that most Christian denominations would find perfectly acceptable. In fact, I have it on good authority from a religious friend that my life is more acceptable than many people she knows who do go to a church and who do love God. In fact, if what I wanted out of my worldview was freedom to sin, I would remain a Christian, sin all I wanted, then repent at the end of my life and be saved, and enjoy the benefits of a free and sinful life and a blissful and guilt-free heaven. And don't try telling me that being a Christian would mean you don't want to sin all you want, because if that were true, I believe there would be very few Christians in the world. Which, come to think of it, many Christians probably do think that there are very few Christians in the world. But those Christians still like to insist that Christianity enjoys a majority in this country when it comes to social and political movements, so when they decide what side of the fence they're on, they can let me know. Anyway, because I have no rational reason to believe in an afterlife, I have all the more reason to act moral. Because if this is all we get, then it matters all the more. Some Christians like to say that nothing matters if there is no afterlife. I think nothing matters nearly as much if there is an eternal afterlife. Whereas, if this is all, then this is everything. 4. There are no atheists. Every atheist, or every professed atheist, knows that God exists. I've done at least one entire video on this one. There's a variation that I haven't mentioned that tries to soften the absurdity. It says there are no inculpable atheists. Every atheist is deliberately suppressing the evidence for God all around them so that they choose to be atheists and are without excuse. Now, I've given my absolute defeater for the first variation of this objection. If God exists, there are no atheists. There is at least one atheist, namely myself, and therefore God doesn't exist. With a little tweaking, that defeater can be used against the second variation as well. If God exists, there are no inculpable atheists, but there is at least one inculpable atheist, namely myself. I have done a thorough and honest search of my own mental states and the evidence around me to make sure of this. Therefore, God does not exist. No amount of evidence will convince someone who does not want to believe, or who is doctrinally committed to not believe, that you are not an atheist or not an inculpable atheist. 
But then I don't think any amount of evidence or argument will convince anyone who is disposed to believe any of these objections in the first place to stop using them. They are, almost without exception, I think, epistemic lost causes. 5. Atheism is a bad bet because if you're right, you gain nothing, and if you're wrong, you'll lose everything, i.e. Pascal's wager. There have actually been attempts in recent years to salvage this argument by philosophers who, judging from their credentials and intelligence, really have absolutely no excuse for not knowing better. There's simply no way around the fact that there are many candidate gods for whom a wager can be constructed. And the only way around the problem that Pascalians can suggest is to proceed from Pascal's wager to other arguments, such as an argument for the resurrection of Jesus. But if Pascal's wager is necessary as a prudential first step prior to considering non-prudential arguments, then these arguments can be no better than eh, good enough to convince those who really, really want to believe in the first place, which is the most backhanded endorsement I can think of. And if the wager is not necessary as a prudential first step, why bother with it? Why not just consider the other arguments? So as I've said in previous videos, if Christians were serious about looking to maximize their potential for a good afterlife or minimize their risk for a bad afterlife, they would become Muslims. I mean, have you read the Quran? That is one awesome heaven and one scary hell. I mean, sure, the arguments from the resurrection and your own inner religious experience may seem convincing to you, but dramatic pause. What if you're wrong? Six, God is love and love exists. So God exists. The first thing that comes to mind when I hear this is the old joke, God is love, love is blind, Ray Charles is blind, therefore Ray Charles is God. Yeah. <laughs> but the second thing that comes to mind is the guy I knew from my days on the alt-atheism news group on Usenet, yes, I'm that old, who insisted for years that God was his toaster oven. I mean, I assume he was kidding, but not even once did he admit or even hint that he was kidding. So, God is my toaster oven, my toaster oven exists, so... Or the pantheists, God is the universe and the universe exists, so... Or the Hindus, the god Varuna is the ocean and the ocean exists, so... Do you get it? You don't get to just define your god into existence, even if that is exactly what ontological arguments try to do. But hey, let me try one. Uh, God is the thousand mile high obelisk at the North Pole, but the thousand mile high obelisk at the North Pole doesn't exist, so... After all, if you get to make an argument about God's existence by defining him a certain way, then so do atheists. Right? That's fair, isn't it? You don't want to be hypocrites, do you? 7. The Bible says that God exists. And the movie Fargo says that Carl Showalter exists. And is the movie Fargo reliable? Well, it takes place partly in Fargo, partly in Minneapolis, and partly in Brainerd, Minnesota. I have been to all of these places. I can confirm that they exist. I can confirm that the IDS Tower, Honeywell, and the Golden Gophers hockey team all exist. Oh, and the first sentence of the film? This is a true story. It claims to be a true story. What more do you need? Oh, and one more thing, just a little thing, but you know, uh, Carl Showalter, whom we saw being fed into a wood chipper in the film, he died, right? Well, you want to tell me how it is that he is alive and well and living in Hollywood today? <laughs> what, you think someone stole the bits of him from the snow and put him back together? You think Marge Gunderson rescued him at the last moment? <laughs> Believe what you like, my friend, but I don't have enough faith to be an A-Carlist. Eight. You may claim to be an atheist, but your use of the laws of logic presupposes. Nine. Why do you hate God? Again, the new atheist movement didn't do us many favors here, but the term for someone who believes that God exists and hates him is misotheist. The term for someone who does not believe that God exists is atheist. A misotheist masquerading as an atheist can be taken down with the why do you hate God thing. A misotheist not masquerading as an atheist will happily tell you why he hates God, and if he's an open misotheist, he's probably given the matter a lot of thought, so proceed at your own risk. Meanwhile, though, an actual atheist will be unaffected by this argument, no matter how many times you repeat it in your college classroom. 10. 
Atheists have to know everything in order to say there is no God. This one resonates with me in a rather personal way. I'll explain why in a moment. First, atheism broadly defined is nothing more than a lack of belief. Second, even those who have a positive belief that God does not exist do not necessarily claim that they know that God does not exist. Third, it is possible to know that God does not exist without knowing everything by finding inconsistencies in the concept of God or by finding inconsistencies between the concept of God and what we would expect to find in the world if he existed. If you're at a beach by yourself, and the sand around you is pristine and untouched, and you fall asleep for a while, and when you wake up the sand is still pristine and untouched, you don't have to know everything in order to know that nobody has walked by you leaving their footprints in the sand while you were asleep. Fourth and finally, and this really is the silliest part of it, even if you had to be omniscient to know there is no God, you don't have to be God to be omniscient. We know of no metaphysical reason why the attribute can't stand alone. So here's why this one resonates with me. When I was in college, I had a philosophy instructor who taught most of my philosophy classes. He didn't teach philosophy of religion, but he taught just about everything else, from modern philosophy to metaphysics to epistemology to philosophy of science and language and so on. And in every class I took from him, he would bring up his disproof of atheism at least once. You know why atheism is absurd, right? Because an atheist is someone who knows there is no God. In order to know there is no God, you have to know everything. And in order to know everything, you have to be God. So atheism is self-refuting. Anyway, what were we talking about? And this is a guy with a doctorate in philosophy. This is a guy who ought to know better. But it gets worse. It gets a lot worse. Because one day, after he had done this for, I don't know, the fourth or fifth time since I had known him, I pulled him aside after class and asked him, You went to Notre Dame, didn't you? He said, yes, I sure did. I said, then you must have studied under Plantinga. He said, yeah, Plantinga was my mentor. I said, where did you get that disproof of atheism from? He said, I got it from Plantinga. Alvin Plantinga, possibly the most respected and decorated Christian philosopher in modern history, certainly the most formidable, and he's teaching his students obvious bullshit. One is simply at a loss for words. I mean, he's not stupid. He knows that the argument he's making is nonsense, and my own instructor ought to have known it as well. So why are they spreading it as if it's a total takedown? Why are they giving their students an instinct to have such little regard for the opposition? We can perhaps find the answer in the fact that Plantinga's greatest achievements in Christian philosophy are the defeater to J.L. Mackey's logical problem of evil, the modal ontological argument, which again is defining God into existence, and reformed epistemology, or the system of properly basic beliefs, which is a system that allows Christians to have a rational Christian belief without or even despite evidence. This guy is the ultimate in Christian retention, and he's also the ultimate in scholarly apologetics. Christianity is in decline. They know it, and they're trying to slow or stop the rate of decline. I've said it before and I'll say it again, apologetics is not a conversion tool, but a retention tool. And I don't envy the popular apologist one bit, especially when this is what he has to work with. These may be among the worst objections to atheism, but we do keep hearing them over and over again. Why do you suppose that is? If you like this video and want to help my channel grow, please hit the like and subscribe buttons. Also, be sure to share this video and my other videos with people you know. And if you want to share your thoughts about these objections to atheism, or have ideas for a 10 more worse objections to atheism video, leave a comment below. Thanks so much for watching, I'm David John Wellman, and the rest is up to you.